there's our scatter plot. Um, we're looking at outliers. Now we note that you may have noticed here, uh, there's a point here up on murder, which is way up here, uh, separate from everything. And so that immediately raises a flag and you might not be able to see it, but there's one here as well, way out there. And here's one. So we're going to go after that murder point and we're going to subset the data uh, just and pull out the murder rates that are higher than 15. And when we do that, we get only one one row, the District of Columbia, where murder is not, not only higher than 15 per 100,000, it's twice as high. And so D.C. obviously is an outlier in terms of murder rates, very high mur per capita murder rates. Um, is, it, is it high in in, in terms of the rates for the other crimes as well. Well, an easy way to answer this question is to plot the data, but then use a special point for DC so we can readily uh, pick out where DC is in all of these uh, scatter plots, which are difficult to, to tease apart because there's so many points. There are 50 points. So we, we do that. We, we're using CEX. This is... Um, the size of the plotting symbol, we're going to make it really big. And um, so if we do that, make it a plus and make it a big plus as well, then you can, you see the pluses in there, they stand out uh, quite, quite readily. And those are all, that's DC. That's DC's point in each one of these. And it's pretty, it's pretty clear that for many of these bivariate relationships, DC is uh, an outlier. So, so we're going to throw that out because that would mess things up quite a bit. And um, so we get rid of DC. Oh, another thing we can do, we, we are going to get rid of DC, but also uh, we need to look at the scaling. And one way to do that, when you start talking about ranges or scales, what you're really talking about is uh, the absolute values of the of the observations, their mean, but also their dispersion. And dispersion is just another t word for variance. So, um, crime this the crime data set has uh, 50 rows and seven numeric variables. S apply is one of the apply family of functions that will uh, that will automatically um, pull out the the average, no, the variance. We're pulling out the variance for each of the seven uh, 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 crime variables. And so, just looking at this, so these are these are the variances of each of those columns of data. And we, you know, it's pretty evident that vehicle theft is is all over the place, very wide dispersion, whereas uh, murder is very narrow. Okay, so we need to address that. We can't use the raw data. Now, here we're going to use the range of each of each column to to perform a quasi standardization. And I did have I did dream up a uh, actually it's recycled an exercise from a course I taught a long time ago. For today, it's in the folder that asks you to redo this analysis, but instead of using range as a standardization, which we're going to do right now, uh, to normalize them, to, to, to normalize them instead, which uh, is pretty easy to do. So this code looks kind of complex, but essentially what you're doing is you're getting, you're, we're using S apply again, and we're going across all of the columns and we're getting the, the high and low of the range. And um, then we, so what we're going to do is we're going to get the range of each column. And then we're going to take the observation in each column and divide it by the range of that column. So when you think about it for a minute, if, the, if you have a lot of big scale items, big measure, big value items, um, once you divide it by the, by the range, it will it will uh, it will reduce it. It'll it'll tend to e e equilibrate or to equalize the ranges for all of the 
columns, or at least that's that's what we're hoping. So if we do that by, by range, and then we go through this um, looking at the variance of each one again, now we can see the variances are all pretty much the same. So by dividing by the range, each point, that is by dividing each point in a column by the range of that column, is almost achieved the exact same thing as you would get if you just standardized them. Okay, so now we're, we can go with clustering, of, and we don't know how many groups to have. So we're going to use some fancy footwork here, coding work, where um, we take this first statement. Note, note, note up here that we made a duplicate of the, of the data set. You may or may not have noticed that. When we sweeped it by range, we named it crime S. And it's, I can tell you firsthand, it's a good idea to, to, to take your data set and make a copy of it and then start fooling around with the copy because more times than not, you'll, you'll goof it up and you'll forget how you got there and then you'll have to go back and get the original data set and start all over. So um, we're working on a, on a copy that has already been standardized. And so N row just counts the number of rows. So we put that in N. Okay, then we are going to create a vector for, to hold the within sum, the within groups sums of squares for a one group, a two group, a three group, a four group, five and six group solution. Rep is uh, replicate, and so what it'll do, it just will create a vector. The output of rep, rep, replicate is a vector with six zeros, and this vector will hold our results. It's always a good idea if you're programming or creating even simple functions in R that are going to process data and continually add results to a data structure. Figure out the size of that data structure beforehand, whether it's a vector, a matrix, a data frame, or a list, whatever it's going to be. Create a dummy structure that's empty and then fill it up. It's much more efficient from a computer point, computer resource point of view, but also You've got all your results in a, you know, in some sort of one handy structure, and you understand the the relationship. That's what we're doing. So here's our vector, and now we, first of all, in the very first element of the vector, we we sum up. What are we trying to do? We're trying to get the within group sums of squares. So we sum up the variance for each of the seven categories. That's what S apply does. So this, this will return, uh, I believe, the variances of each of them, right? And so then we sum that, and we have to multiply it. To get the within group sums of squares, you have to multiply it by the degrees of freedom, which would be n minus 1. So we do that. And now if we look at WSS, we note that the first element has been filled up. This is a, a one-group solution which, you know, is not a solution at all. You're going to have at least two groups. So we're, we're safe to do that. But it gives us a basis to plot as well. So now we go through the rest of it to a two-group solution to a six-group solution, and we just perform uh, the a very similar computation, but note that we are specifically now using um, the centers and we're using we're using a k-means function that uh, w w the output of the k-means function will be, it automatically computes the within group sums of, sums of squares. So this is, this is from the k-means package itself. So we, we do that. And we can take a look at the uh, uh, cascading, if you will, within group sums of squares. And I didn't do something, which is why it's not there. So let's try it again. I missed the for loop. So we do it like that. And now let's take a look at it now before we plot it. And you can see with each successive addition of, a, of another group to the solution, um, it is reducing. That's the objective is to reduce this number, the within group sums of squares. But you're getting diminishing returns because you're not reducing it as much. So a four-group solution would, would not be much better than a three-group. 
And um, so anyway, uh, we can plot it. Let's do that. So here we plot, and we saw this in the slide a second ago. So there's our, and this is typical with cluster analysis. You know, you don't, you can't just push a button and walk, walk, and the answer comes to you. You've got to go in there. There's stopping points where you need to go in there and make a judgment call um, often, uh, which is why a lot of people don't like to use it. But the, so anyway, there we go. Uh, it looks like a two-group solution might be the best. And now um, that's where the elbow is, so we'll go with that. So we use the k-means function directly against the uh, range normalized data and we say centers are two that means two groups and um, so we do all that and these are the centroids these are really just the means of the the observations that are members of the two group two groups k means will separate them into two groups in such a way that it minimizes the within group sums of squares and then this is just these numbers are just reflective of the of the um, of the uh, me, uh, mean for each one, and you can see there quite there are differences quite quite dramatic differences between ones and twos, which is what you want. Now, if your data is homogeneous to begin with, this is not going to work. I mean, it's just a, it's a technique to find distinct heterogeneous groups but only if they exist so that's another reason people get discouraged is because there's no guarantee you'll get even a decent solution but it's it's a technique that's worth looking at okay so um, now we're going to label the members based on their group their group membership we're going to give them a special symbol unique symbol and then plot them against the first and second principal component. PR comp just automatically uh, computes the first and second principal components out of the data set. And um, then we're going, going to plot them. And if we zoom this, hopefully you at home can see this as well. There is separation. The triangles are members of one group, and the circles are the members of another group. But when you look at this, it's pretty clear that the separation is, is all along the first principal component. You could draw a line right about here. And one group's on this side, and one group's on this side. They are not distinct at all with respect to the second principal component. You know, if you had a cluster here and a cluster here and a cluster here, that would be optimal, but that really rarely happens. And in this case, we do see, we do see that they are, there are true clusters, but only on this one dimension. And that's because that's the way the data is.